Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, I hope you you advance enough in your in your lunch to uh, listen to us a bit. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here today and to be here with uh, with uh, with Hubert for this uh, leadership spotlight discussion. Uh, Hubert is best known as the former chairman and CEO of Best Buy. He, before Best Buy, he was also uh, CEO and uh, and, and president of Carlson, um, and Carlson Travel before that, I think, and uh, Vivendi and EDS, and uh, having started his career as a consultant, um, nobody's perfect, right? It's man's highest calling. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Hubert is also a member of the uh, board of directors of Johnson & Johnson and the Ralph Lauren uh, Corporation, um, and has been uh, recognized as one of the uh, best performing CEOs by a number of entities and your, your, your peers. Um, during, uh, during your time at Best Buy, Hubert, you and your team rebuilt the company into a, a high-performing company, and uh, we're gonna try to uh, focus on that and on the lessons that you, you drew from that. Um, you stepped down as a CEO in, uh, in uh, 2019 and uh, as executive chairman in 2020 and passed the baton to a new generation of leaders. Uh, you're now a senior lecturer at uh, Harvard Business School and uh, the author of uh, The Heart of Business, for those who have not uh, seen it, uh, highly recommended. So it's The Heart of Business uh, and the uh, subtitle is Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism and I think that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about now. I think it's available in the, in the library and I can only encourage you to, to read it. Uh, I've had the good fortune personally of knowing Hubert since the mid 90s. Um, and, uh, and you, you and I were really young at the time. Yeah, but <laughs> even younger. And uh, uh, you have always been a source of inspiration. Uh, I'm a fan. I can, I can say that. Therefore, I feel privileged to be sitting here today. My first question, Hubert, is going to be a bit personal, uh, I guess. Uh, you were educated and, and worked. Uh, in France and in the US. I don't know where you spend most time, actually, whether you spend more time in the US or not. It's 50 50% 50 of my adult life, so okay. that's one. I'm, All uh, right. I don't know how to decide. Maybe we need to ask ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have been a consultant, as I said, an executive, and now a professor, coach, and an evangelist. Um, that's what the bio says. But who are you? <laughs> how do you define yourself? Who am I? Let, well, let me first congratulate you and Alex and Eric and Paul for you know putting together this terrific conference. It's a privilege to uh, be able to attend. Learned so much you know last night and and this morning. So thank you for that. You. Who am I? Uh, I would say first, who I'm not. So I was never my position. So my identity was never tied to any one of my jobs, which for from a mental health standpoint was you know has been very helpful. So means when I stepped down from my role at Best Buy, I was still me, right? I was no longer the CEO of Best Buy, I was still me. So maybe the way to define me um, is through my, my purpose in life, right? Which today is to help the next generation of leaders deal with the mess that we've left them <laughs> and hope that they can create a, a future that does not exist yet, but that can be better than what we have. So more defined by my purpose than my uh, job. And maybe in terms of... Uh your evolution as a, as a leader, your masterpiece is uh, in terms of management philosophy and the way Masterpiece you means, you know, what you get in the Middle Ages, it's what you get at the end uh, of your apprenticeship. So it doesn't mean it's any good, it's just what you get at the <laughs> end of your apprenticeship. <laughs> right, but that's the, that's the best buy story. It doesn't yeah. seem to be too, too bad, actually, from what we can judge from the, at least from the outside, and that's what you describe in your book. Um, it, uh, the, your, your management philosophy is quite different from uh, what people um, learn in school, I guess. It's quite different from what we, we do in consulting uh, on, or what we did in consulting when you were a consultant. I think we've evolved a bit from, yeah. from that. Um, and before diving into the detail of that base by story, how did you come to realize that this was the way to go? Uh, have you had, you know, haha -ha moment or... or breakthrough discussions or, or things that, that change your philosophy? 
Yes, so I think 100% uh, of leaders were born. None of us were born a leader. And so our story, my story is certainly a story of transformation, personal transformation, going all the way from being a hard charging McKinsey consultant, all about uh, problem solving and performance optimization, and now somebody who believes in human magic. And I didn't smoke anything illegal along the way, uh, <laughs> at least on the record. Didn't inhale. <laughs> Uh, maybe, you know, milestones along the way that were transformative, maybe two or three uh, to, that, that had Im an impact. So the first one was maybe 30 years ago when I was asked by a couple of friends who are monks to write with them uh, an article about the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work? Right? Is, uh, is work a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? Uh, or is work something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun, like spend a weekend in Cannes? Or is work part of our fulfillment as human beings and an invitation to, to serve in the world, right? And you were talking to me about why you've stayed all of these years in consulting. It was to serve your clients. So Viktor Frankl in particular, you know, highlights this. That he says that there's three sources for meaning, uh, you know, in this great book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. One is courage. Second is love, and the third is work. Now, unfortunately, there's a pandemic of disengagement. Maybe we'll come back to this. And you know, maybe the human intelligence could be much more powerful if we could unleash that, uh, that potential. So that was the first milestone. The second milestone for me was 20 years ago. So I have a milestone every 10 years, you could say, roughly. Uh, so in many ways, you know, I had reached, to quote David Brooks, the, the top of my first mountain. I'd been a partner at McKinsey at a young age. Uh, I was on the executive team of Vivendi Universal. So, you know, around 40 years old, quite successful, you could say. Uh, and yet, at the top of that first mountain, there was no joy. Uh, there was no taste. Uh, and probably I had gotten lost along the way. Uh, call, call this my midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. Maybe this has never happened to anyone in the room. Uh, and so that forced me to step back and reflect on my life and what was driving me in life. And I realized that at the time I'd been too driven by power, fame, glory, and money. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good driver for, for some, but for me, I realized it was not a good driver. And so that led me to step back and, and reflect on my life and try to discern what's my real calling in life. What's, uh, and it was not power, fame, glory, and money. It was again back to serving mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and trying to be a positive force in the, in, in the world. And then the third milestone was in 2009. So at the time I was the CEO of Carlson Companies and uh, one day my head of HR, Elizabeth Bastoni, walks into my office and uh, uh, asked me, would you like to work with a coach? I said, what, have, has somebody complained? Have I done something wrong? Because coaching at the time was quite remedial. And I said, no, 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 it's, it's all good. I have this guy, Marshall Goldsmith, maybe some of you uh, know him or have heard of him. He specializes in helping successful leaders get better. Some of his clients are, you know, Alan Mulally, the then CEO of Ford, uh, Dr. Jim Kim, the, the president of the World Bank, and, and, and. I said, oh, sign me up. And Marshall was very helpful to me because in, in my quest for perfection, I really struggled with feedback. When I would, I would get feedback, I would say, who said that? What's wrong with them? And Marshall uh, helped me embrace the idea of feet forward. What are the areas where I'd like to get better? And how can I get help to get better on the way? So he taught me humility and vulnerability, which I think in this uh, uncertain world where you know, the one thing we know is that we don't know, being able to say, my name is Hubert and I need help is a very useful phrase. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the milestones along the way. All right, so in 2012, uh, you, you were asked to take, uh, take over Best Buy. Best Buy was on the verge of a collapse uh, under the attack of, uh, at least that was the, the perception, uh, under the attack of Amazon and the likes of, uh, I guess, Apple and Samsung uh, launching their own uh, retail network. Um, why did you accept to become the CEO and, and, uh, and, and how did you start? Yeah. So, um Many of my friends in Minneapolis at the time thought that I was either crazy or suicidal for taking the job, right? Because uh, so for those of us outside of the U.S., Best Buy is a big consumer electronics retailer 
you have one like that in every country around uh, the world. It had been a, a, great, a great American success story, but uh, was indeed on a, uh, on a downward slope. So I got a call from Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart. Many of you know him. He uh, does a lot of the CEO and, and board searches in the US. Great friend of mine. And when he called, he said, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail, and this place has become a zoo, so why would you like me to do this? He said, do me a big favor. They're not looking for a retailer. I know you know nothing about retail, but you know, uh, at least take a look. And so before meeting with the, the search committee, I realized I did some research, due diligence, and I, I realized a couple of things. One is uh, the world actually needed Best Buy. Right? For some of our product purchases, electronic, you, you, it's actually helpful to be able to talk to somebody and see the product. Right? You cannot test the sound quality of a speaker if it's not in, in real life. Uh, so the, the customers needed Best Buy, and importantly, the vendors also needed Best Buy, because they spend billions of dollars uh, uh, on R&D, and they need a, show, uh, a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of, of R&D. So strategically, it was actually fine. But the second thing I found out is that the, the com well, the company had a lot of problems, they were all self-inflicted, right? Prices were too high, the online shopping experience was mediocre, uh, the experience in the stores had deteriorated, the cost structure was bloated, and, and, and. What's the good news with self-inflicted problems? You can fix them. You didn't need to call you know, Jeff Bezos and say, stop bothering us, right? <laughs> and so that gave me the sense that there was enough assets to effectuate a turnaround. And then how, how did you start then? Oh, how did I start? Um, so the first thing, uh, a bit like uh, IBM in 1993 when Lou Gershner became CEO, uh, you probably all remember that the thing he said at the time was the last thing that IBM needs at this time is a vision, we need execution. And it was the same for Best Buy. So we started with operational performance improvement. And I can tell you the what we did, but I'll, I'll highlight in particular the how, because I think it's the how where the magic was. The what was about uh, matching Amazon prices to take price off the table, investing in the online shopping experience, uh, investing in the supply chain, so now we, Best Buy ships as fast or faster than Amazon, investing in the, in the, uh, in the store customer experience, taking some cost out, uh, importantly, partnering with the vendors uh, uh, which was a game changer, because when we decided to match Amazon prices, the, uh, the investors said, yeah, that's nice, we understand why you're doing this. If you don't, you're gonna die, but if you do, you're still gonna die because your cost structure is higher than competition. But the partnership with the vendors was a game changer, so the, I said that the, 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 they needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their investments, and the, the first deal was with Samsung, uh, who had a choice. They could either build stores like uh, uh, Apple had done, or they could do a deal with us, 1,000 stores in the US, and in a matter of weeks, they had 1,000 Samsung stores within Best Buy. So good for the customers, good for the vendors, and good for us because it helped our, uh, our P&L, and uh, over time, we ended up uh, doing a deal with all of the major uh, tech companies, including Intel at some point. We had. Uh, with Brian Krasanek, we did a, a deal at the time, uh, and so it helped the, the, the trajectory. That's the what. The how is more interesting, because when I teach that, uh, or we teach that case at HBS, it takes about 20 minutes for the students to figure out that's what you needed to do. The how is more interesting. It was a very human-centric approach to the turnaround. All right? uh, the investors and that is all were saying, cut, 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 you know, the usual recipe for turnarounds, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to close a lot of stores and fire a lot of people. So we looked, all of the stores were profitable. Mm -hmm. So closing stores was not gonna be yeah. a big element of the recipe. And firing a lot of people, it assumed that people were the problem. I thought people would be the solutions. Now, every company on the planet, probably including everyone in the room, says people, that's the most important thing. So the question is, what specifically did we do? It started with listening to the frontliners. I spent my first week on the job working in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I think you would say St. Cloud, but over there they, they, they insist on saying St. Cloud. Saint Cloud. But St. Cloud is not in Minnesota for us. Then well, but there's one in Minnesota. Them. They have That's one, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the frontliners, the questions I asked them was, uh, what's working, what's not working, what do you need? They had all of the answers. And better than people in headquarters because they were closer to the 
actually. My job was pretty simple. It was show up, ask the questions, listen, uh, and uh, take notes, and then importantly, do as we were told. Mm -hmm. um, the other element of the human-centric approach, so I'm a bit of a Maoist, uh, fish rot from the head. If things are going well in an organization, always credit the frontliners. If they're not going well, always look at the top. So we changed a good chunk of the management team. It's so start with people, also end with people. In a term, and that's something I, had, I learned from a client. I had a deal with my clients, Xavier, I hope you have the same, which is they would pay me and I would learn a lot. I'm talking about my clients yeah, at no, McKinsey. I would learn from them. That's, that's a great the business model. For that's the business that. model. Okay, yeah. good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I had learned from a client is that, you know, turn around, he said, about, you know, number one, increase the revenue. It's amazing what revenue growth can do. Mm. Number two, uh, if you're going to go after costs, which you have to, go after non salary expenses, okay. which is the bulk of the cost structure, and headcount reduction is only as a last resort. And then the last piece of the human-centric approach was this idea of creating energy. Mm. Right? In physics, we learned that uh, energy is a finite quantity. But in business, in a human organization, you can actually create energy. A big role of, of us as leaders is not to be the smartest person in the room, uh, because that's, you know, that doesn't make a big difference. But it's, it's about uh, mobilizing the organization, creating this energy. So how do you do this? You co-create the plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't need a perfect plan. You start getting going. You celebrate the early wins. And then if something is not working, you say it. Maybe you and I have worked on an initiative. It didn't work. So we, maybe we asked Bob to uh, help us with this. Uh, so that was the, the essence was this human-centric approach that allowed us to mm -hmm. remobilize the organization. And, so, and then early wins and creating a, exactly. a, a yeah. momentum and so yeah. on. So that's the, that's the first phase. Yeah. That's whatever, three, four years. I don't yes. know exactly how long it takes. How do you how do you sustain? How do you go, you know, one one step uh, further, oh. one step beyond? What's, so, the, what's the second phase? Yeah, so I, I'm a big believer that you know when when you lead or maybe it's in business life or in your life you have chapters, right? So after three mm -hmm. or four years, uh, and it's a board member Patrick Doyle who told me about you need to officially declare that the turnaround is over, right? Because the turnaround is a certain mindset. You know, it's about not failing. It's about controlling. Uh, it's about operational improvements, about fixing pain points. So you need to move to a more growth-oriented mindset. So we went from Renew Bloom to building the new Bloom. And that was more about, so we it started with, how do we grow the company? And how do we build a company that, you know, uh, what should it look like? So we did work on the strategy, but we also, that's when we started to work on purpose. And you've written a beautiful article uh, on, the, on, on the topic. And so we said we're actually not a consumer electronics retailer. We're a company that's there to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs. Now, every company now has a purpose. Uh, it's a good thing. It's inspiring. It, uh, it opens up more growth avenue. But uh, you cannot just uh, stop there, of course. You have mm -hmm. to make the purpose the keystone of the strategy. So we identified a number of initiatives around how to make that purpose come to life. You know, there's a, 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 we could get into details, but it's not an infomercial about Best Buy, although it may sound like one. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we launched an in-home advisor program where we'll come to you for free. If, you're, if your need is too complex to be handled in a store or online, we'll come to you and we'll, we'll be like a designer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll create a solution for your home theater room. Uh, and we can become your CIO, CTO for your, for your home. Or we went into the health business helping aging seniors with technology stay and live in their home independently longer, which is a much better alternative than you know, going uh, spending time in the hospital. But the, the magic uh, was on the other leg of this triangle. So there's a purpose, strategy, and culture triangle. And we created an environment where you could have this human magic at scale. Mm -hmm. And this phrase, human magic, uh, we coined it following something that, that happened in one of our stores. Uh, and it was probably in 2018. And um, I learned about that story one day. So this is what had happened in a store in Florida. And uh, in that store one day, there is a young mother who comes back to the store with her child. And the child is very sad because they, you know, at Christmas, I think it was, the, the little boy had received as a gift a dinosaur toy. 
But the sad thing is that the dinosaur got really sick. The way we know the dinosaur got sick is that the head was dismantled from the rest of the body. <laughs> so really sick. And uh, presumably, they, they, you know, they go back to the store where Santa Claus would have bought the, the, the toy, the dinosaur. And uh, at most stores, you know, I don't know your experience, but you would have been sent to the toy aisle, and with some luck, you would have been able to, to buy a replacement. But that's not what the little boy wanted. He wanted a cure for the dinosaur. And on that day in that Best Buy store, there's two blue shirt associates who understood what was going on. And so they took the dinosaur, and they went behind a counter mm -hmm. and started performing a surgical procedure. And taking this little boy step by step through the, the, the procedures of the, uh, of the surgery and gave back to the little boy a cured dinosaur. So you can imagine the joy of the little boy and his mother uh, at, at the time. And of course, the question is, do you think that at the time there was a standard operating procedure at Best Buy on how to cure dino uh, sick dinosaurs, or even better, a uh, memo from the French CEO on how to do this, right? You know, you, no, of course not. And it's these two associates who find it in their heart, right, to, uh, on their own volition, to uh, decide that they were going to cure the, the dinosaur. What we don't know economically is how much they charged for the surgery. In the US, it may have been extended, but we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so there may be a good economic model. And, but irrespective, when I heard that story, I, and it, this was a time where our, our comparable sales our growth was accelerating significantly mm -hmm. to a point where it was you know, almost too good to be true. It was surprisingly good. And I realized at the time that what we had done is created an environment where at scale, 100,000 blue shirts could actually decide that they were going to delight the customers. And, the, and I learned so much around uh, you know, what it takes to create such an environment. And it's not the old model mm -hmm. of you take a bunch of smart people and they create a smart plan and then they roll it out and tell everybody else what to do, putting incentives in place. Um, incentives, you know, if you use carrots and sticks, you get donkeys. All right, so that's, you don't create magic. So we learn a lot about what it creates, what it takes to create this magical environment where at scale people want to uh, do their best and be their best and connect what drives them with their work and the purpose of the company. All right, thank you. That's very inspiring uh, stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to be my last question, so the, the next, uh, next ones will be for, for you. Um, you stepped down. Um, in, from, from your role uh, after, I don't know, seven, eight years, something like that, uh, and just before COVID. And, uh, and, uh, and, and as I remember, um, I don't know if it's the right word, but you were rather a, a low profile CEO, not going on, on TV or, or not entering uh, multiple interviews or anything like that. And then you've decided to kind of go public uh, with, uh, with your book with your role at Harvard, with the, uh, all, all the, the work that, that you're doing to, to share your experience. Uh, what's the reason for this coming out? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, there was, there was a reason to not be very public, or to, to not be on TV when I was CEO, is that we were busy fixing the company. So mm -hmm. that was, uh, but I, I find, and that's a generally shared view, I think, today, that the and we talked about it this morning, that's very connected with the conversations. The, the world we live in, you can say, is not working, right? We've had, we have this poly crisis or this perma uh, crisis. And what's the definition of madness, right? To do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. Mm -hmm. And for me, on my FBI most wanted list, there's two people. One is Milton Friedman, right? P shareholder primacy. And the other one is uh, Bob McNamara, who uh, invented scientific management and top-down uh, management. These two things don't work. And so my view is that uh, we need a refoundation of business around purpose and people, and a purpose that embraces all stakeholders in a, in a sense, a, a declaration of interdependence. Right? Best Buy is, is based in Minneapolis, so following the murder of George Floyd, it's very clear, if the city is on fire, you cannot open your stores, right? If, if, the, if the planet is on fire, you don't have a business. So the old notion that uh, as business leaders, we could just be responsible for ha what happens in the four walls of our business, that's no longer sustainable. Uh, and the idea is that um, uh, human resources, labor is an input mm -hmm. 
uh, to an output that should be profit. That doesn't work either. So it's the refoundation of business around the pursuit of a noble purpose, embracing all stakeholders, putting people at the center and, and treating profit as an outcome, not the, uh, not the uh, primary goal, not the, the goal, it's an outcome. And this has you know, significant uh, leadership implications. It, it's easy today to be pretty desperate about the state of the world, right? If you were not desperate st before the morning, I think you're probably desperate <laughs> at the end of the morning. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> uh, and I think this is, in a sense, this is a, uh, a great leadership moment. Right. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, as leaders, we can look back ten years from now and say this was our finest hour. Right. And in a world of uncertainty and challenges, and greater and greater expectations vis-à-vis -vis businesses in a context where expectations vis-à-vis -vis governments are going down, uh, business leaders have this big responsibility to ensure that uh, business is a force for good. Uh, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir because there's now so many uh, examples of companies that are embracing this uh, idea. Uh, and, and, and of course, that means that we need to uh, invent new ways of, uh, of driving companies. This has significant leadership implications. Mm. The, the model of leadership that I, I learned uh, last century was the, 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 the leader is the smartest person in the room, make sure everybody knows how smart they are. Uh, and you know this is what uh, Satya Nadella calls, you know, has termed the, the know-it-alls. Uh, the leader is the superhero. Mm. Uh, that clearly doesn't work today in a world where we don't know, right? That's the, the constant. Given all of these crises, we, we don't know the answer. So, I think the the, the model that has emerged uh, uh, from a leadership standpoint is a model where we use words like uh, vulnerability, uh, authenticity, humility. Uh, humanity, uh, and it's a leader that's uh, driven by I think, a, a, a purpose. He's curious about the purpose of people around them, uh, and he's there to create an environment where you can unleash that uh, that, that human magic, co-creating, you know, the, the solution and and, and uh, enabling the human beings at the company to to be their best. Uh, that's a very different business model. The, the, the I'm finding that uh, most companies are embark on this on this purpose journey. Uh, the biggest challenge is changing ourselves, right? That's always that. And it's, uh, uh, ch you know, a change from the inside out as we try to create a future that's, uh, that's better than what mm -hmm. we have. And so I felt that uh, with the, you know, at my young age of uh, 64 uh, in a couple of months, am I wiser? I have more, do I have more experience, more network than I had 20 years ago? Yes, I do. And so uh, I can use this next chapter to help the next generation of leaders, and that's why I wrote this book. That's why I'm now teaching uh, at Harvard Business School, and, and uh, uh, taking that's why you're here. and that's why I'm here. No, I'm here because I love yeah. you. Well, thank that's you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that that concludes our, our lunch discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Hubert. Thank you.